Uh, good morning. So today uh, we're going to uh, talk about statistics more, and then today we're going to talk about G test, T test, and then ANOVAS, and then some non-parametric testing as well. So last time we have talked about the what is the statistics, and then we talked about the what was the descriptive statistics. The this, uh, and then today we're going to talk about the what is uh, influential statistics. Last time, as I mentioned, because uh, descriptive statistics is still very valid to look at the, each tendency of the data, but still uh, it is not possible to understand or uh, predict each uh, characteristic of the population. So using the influential statistics, uh, we selected some samples and then analyzed some statistics over the sample, and then finally we will predict about the characteristic of the total population that is the st influence of statistics. And the last time we have talked about the what is the mean and the what was the, the median and the mod and the what was the standard deviation, right? As we just uh, uh, mentioned about the influence of statistics, we want to have some prediction about the total population. So it is sometimes not possible to uh, get the census. So we want to select some sample data, and then after that, uh, we will do some statistics. So the expected output is usually p-value, which is uh, it is a difference, significant difference or not. Uh, for that, uh, the inference statistics is uh, starting with a hypothesis testing that we talked the last time, maybe one month ago. And then the basic hypothesis is that there is a no effect, which means there is a no difference between the two samples, between, uh, between the two samples. And then last time, uh, we also mentioned about, usually we use a, a point, uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.01 as a alpha, alpha level, which is uh, which level we took the, uh, the p-value. Uh, can you remember what was the type 1 error and the type 2 error? What was that? Yeah, we remember the table, right? Yeah. And then the type one error is uh, because basically we, uh, when we doing hypothesis testing, we said null hypothesis, and then what was that? Alternative hypothesis. What does it mean the null hypothesis? That is uh, there is no big difference. So exactly that is uh, we could say that is the same, and then the alternative hypothesis mean there is a difference. We don't know which one is large, which one is uh, small, but. Uh, even though we don't know that, but we can still say there is uh, something different. That is an uh, alternative hypothesis. But the as uh, literally error, uh, error means uh, we couldn't make uh, some error when we after we doing some statistics. So, for example, actually the result should uh, say there is no no big difference, which is uh, it support. Uh, no hypothesis, but after we doing something wrong, after finally we come with there is a, some uh, difference. We can say that is a type one error. For example, some company wanted to develop new type of interface for their AT, ATM the machine, but after they uh, running some statistics, actually even though there is a no big difference between the new type of interface and the traditional interface, but some researchers doing some wrong. So he finally uh, got some result. We have to change the, we have to change the interface. In the case, we, we could say this is a, a type one error. And then what is a type two error? Even though there is a, actually there is a, they should have a, some difference, but because of some wrong statistics, my final outcome is there is no big difference. This is a type two error. So last time we have talked about type one error is usually more expensive. 
because as, as I just gave us some example here, even though there is no big difference, but because of some uh, wrong statistics, uh, the company finally decided to, okay, we, we're gonna change the old interface for current ATM. Then actually cost-wise, that is very expensive. For the reason, usually we set 0 .0, uh, 0.5 as a alpha level to prevent the, the type one error. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, right, so uh, last time I also talked about the how we can gather in the, the, uh, the data because uh, uh, if we uh, get the data in a wrong way, then actually the analyzation will not have any meaning. So we have to uh, browse the data and then check it out the descriptive statistics first. And then if you can do the, uh, the graph, then you can see the tendency as well. And then you can also identify the error or outlier from the, the box plot uh, graph. So we can see if some outlier is a really error or there is some meaning. So we have to decide it with the outlier as well. And then we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but uh, if you have an interval or ratio data, then you have to, we have to check it out, is this normally distributed or not? Because normal distribution has its own characteristic. As we mentioned the last time, what does it mean? It have to has a bell shape, something like that, and then it have to be symmetrical. So, uh, based on the middle, the mean, and the mod, and the medium values, the left and right side is identical. That is the, that was the characteristic. All right, so let's talk about the sampling. So uh, there is a two type of samples. One can, we can call it tangible, and then the other one is a, a abstract population. What does it mean? So, the upper image says that we have uh, some fixed population. For example, mm, if uh, University of Canterbury want to make uh, some, uh, want to change some curriculum based on the intelligence level for the university student. But if we wanted to get all the data, if we want to collect all the data individually, then maybe it will take uh, it will take uh, much cost and uh, time-wise and uh, money-wise, and um, sometimes in, it is prone to make an uh, error. So maybe that is not a good way. So maybe we can use uh, uh, the data, which is uh, average university students uh, intelligence level, which was conducted before. So maybe we can borrow the, some data from them and then make uh, some decision regarding our curriculum. So in this case, we borrowed some samples from the pre-existed population, so that is uh, much tangible, right? But um, is this still valid for coming freshman student for the next year, and then 2020, 2021, 2022? Is this still valid? Yeah. Uh, somehow valid and somehow it is uh, also includes some errors. But in this case, um, maybe we can still adopt this way because we just conjecture. Uh, the characteristic for the coming student also has a similar level. Even though we don't know exactly how, what, what will be, what it will, their intelligence level, but still we can conjecture the characteristic will be same. So in this case, we can predict its uh, characteristic of the population from the sample. So that indicates the, the bottom image. So from the sample, we could infer, even though there is a no uh, perfect population, there is, there is not a perfect uh, population because we don't know the data from the upcoming freshman for the next year and then the, the other next year, but we can still conjecture its population based on our sample data. 
So this is the, just a two way how we can sample the data from the population and how we can create the population as well. So uh, inference statistics, there is a two way. The one is a parametric test and the other way is a non-parametric test. So we could say that the parametric test is a, uh, we, we have uh, some assumption that is the data is an interval or ratio data. So that is a, uh, including some real number or a floating number, and then that is a ratio. And then uh, parametric test assume that the shape is normally distributed. And then we already know the mean value and the variance for the parametric. What does it mean non-parametric? If some data does not meet with this requirement, then we say that there is a non-parametric. What does it mean? We don't know the mean and the, we don't know the variance. And then it doesn't have to be follow the normal distribution. And then the data format normally uh, ordinal data and the nominal data. So in this case, we use uh, non-parametric statistics. So I'm going to talk about uh, the category of the parametric uh, statistics and the non-parametric statistics. But uh, I would like to give us some quick example. For example, uh, if you use a questionnaire like a presence questionnaire or usability questionnaire. In this case, you can use a record scale, one to seven, one to five, whatever. In this case, uh, how do you think? Is, do we need to run with a parametric uh, test or non-parametric test in this case? How do you think? Using record scale uh, for for the presence questionnaire, which is a, a much qualitative uh, data set rather than quantitative data set. So in this case, what statistics do you want to, to run? Parametric or non-parametric? Because uh, using the record scale and then present questionnaire is um, uh, more nominal data, so we, we or uh, ordinal data, so we can use a non-parametric test, right? Then what about uh, if we want? I ha I gather I collect the all the data from the the mass score from each student. In this case, what test would be would be good to run the statistics? I just get, a, get a the scores. The scale range is a zero to 100. Because in this case, that is an interval uh, scale, so we can apply the parametric test, okay? So because this is just the beginning of the statistics, so maybe it is a bit hard to, how can I apply the which, which statistics uh, would be good to this kind of a data set, but uh, I'm sure you, you're gonna getting familiar with that uh, strategy. Uh, before I talk about the, uh, talk more about the statistics, I'm going to, I would like to introduce some uh, phenomenon that is a sampling regarding sampling distributions. Uh, just imagine there's a 1,000 population. We don't know what kind of data set, just let's say there is a 1,000 population. The interesting phenomenon is if I just collect uh, 10 uh, samples from that uh, the population, then maybe the distribution is, uh, is just a goal uh, with like a, this kind of flat. But if I get more data from the population and then collect more samples, another 10, and, the, uh, and then check out each mean, mean value. And also, if I do, uh, if I collect the, uh, another samples, let's say I'm the 10 samples and the calculate the mean, and if I iteratively run this way, then uh, each shape is, looks like this normal, uh, if follows normal distribution, looks like this one. Uh, OK. 
population, let's say. There is a total population, there is the number of population is 1,000. And then the, maybe there is a, some mean value. I'm not sure, maybe let's say it is uh, just uh, 15. 15 is the mean value of the, this population. I just want to, because uh, census is uh, expensive, so I just want to take uh, some part of this one, and then uh, that is uh, my sample, which is uh, just uh, 10. So I just get the, uh, this is uh, my sample number. And then I can get the, the mean value. I'm not sure what is the mean, so maybe the mean is a three. So in this case, maybe three is here. And then I just, uh, also I want to get the other samples, so number is the same. So, and then maybe the mean value will be five or, uh, or seven, six. And then the other sample is here, so maybe eight. And then if I iteratively do this way, then the mean value distribution will be, is to follow the, this kind of a normal distribution. This is, a, we call that as a central limit theorem. Which means if we collect enough number of samples, then the total distribution, uh, the shape is following the normal distribution. That is a, just a phenomenon. So we call that as a central limit theorem. So based on this central limit theorem, we can conduct the z-test. What is the z-test? Have you heard about that z-test? Okay, so basically this is a parametric uh, test. What was the characteristic of the parametric test? What do you remember? I just mentioned before in the previous slide. So what is the character of the parametric test? It follows the normal distribution, which means it has a base shape, which means it has a, a symmetrical shape, right? And the, what is the, the other condition? We always know the mean value and the variance of the population, right? So in this case, maybe there is some uh, data set already somewhere else, and the, we always know each uh, variance and each uh, uh, mean value. So based on the, the given data set, if we collect some sample data, then we simply just compare each distribution uh, compared to the pre-existed distribution. That is a g-test. So in here, so this normal shape, we, we assume this, this phenomenon follows the central limit theorem. So this is a normal distribution. And then we don't know which sample we wanted to compare to which population. But in this case, certain population follow this central limit theorem, which means it is a normal distribution. Which means the shape is symmetrical, and then we always know its variance, uh, its variance and the mean value of the population. So already we, we given certain data set, and then we want to collect something data which is our sample, and we wanted to compare the samples, uh, the distribution compared to this normal distribution. That is a z-test. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So in this case, let's uh, see this one first. So we wanted to having some hypothesis, hypothesis testing. Uh, maybe we can say, the, the mu zero, the, what, the null hypothesis that is a mu zero, which is, a, let's say, this is a uh, oscillator program, so just don't care about what this, does it mean. Let's say just a mu zero. The mu zero is a rather than or equal to mu one. That is a null hypothesis. And the, what is the alternative hypothesis? That is a mu zero is less than mu one. That is an uh, alternative hypothesis, right? And because in this case, we can make some comparison, which one will be larger or which one will be um, sm smaller rather than something comparison. 
So we, we could say this is a directional. Normally we say that this is a directional. So if the hypothesis is directional things, then we can say that it's a wanted key test, wanted. So um, next, in, in the next slide, we, we will see what is a two-tailed key test. So there is a one-tailed or two-tailed only, okay? So in this case, we always know the population here, and then we also know the standard deviation here, and the, this is our sample number of sample data, and this is the, our sam uh, the sample means. So the standard deviation for the sampling distribution, we have to know to calculate this one because just think about it. So we always know that the sigma, the sigma is comes from the each population data, right? So we want to know how much our sample data is uh, uh, deviated from uh, compared to the given sample data, uh, given population. So this is a uh, make sense, right? This is comes from the, the normal distribution, the population. Uh, this is the standard deviation from the population, and the, we wanted to divide with our number, our sample number, right? So we can get finally this number. This is a standard deviation from our, popu from our sample number. Does it make sense, right? And then finally, we can calculate the G-score. What, what does it mean, the G-score? The G-score is uh, based on the middle value, how much our, our data distribution is deviated from the, the mean in the middle, right? So that is the reason why we calculate this one. This is uh, our, um, the standard deviation from our sample data, and we divide, divide the our mean value, which is a sample, sample mean value here, and then this is the total mean value of the population. So finally, we can get this number. Then what does it mean, that number? Let's say this number is a G-score, right? That is a G-score, and then this axis represent G-score. Am I correct, right? So this is a G-score, and then we always know that the middle represents zero, right? Which means there is no deviation based on the, the middle line, right? So this is a negative, so we want to go this way, and then how much? 1.67. So somewhere else, because it says that this is the uh, 1.645 here, so maybe our value will be located around here. Am I correct? And then what does it mean? Because um, the researchers already calculated all the distribution about the G-test, so we can just borrow the table for the G-test distribution. And it says that um, at the, the significant level is a 0 0.05, and then this is a G-critical value, which is a, 1.645 or whatever that is a possible one, 1.645, this is the threshold we can uh, predict. Uh, if some value is over the 1.645 here, then we can say that it's a significant. Or if some value is less than here, then we can, we can say that it's not significant. So based on this value, our value is uh, located around here, so we could say our data set is a, uh, has a, the p-value is a significant because the p-value is less than 0.5. It doesn't matter negative or positive. We want to know the each, uh, uh, how much our value is large or, or small, right? So this is the, our sample. So usually we represent, after we doing the G-test, we usually represent with this way. So we conducted the G-test, the number of sample was 50, and then the G-score was uh, negative 
1.67, and then the p-value was less than 0.5, 0 0 0.05, and there was a one k test. Do you think that this value is mean? Uh, in this case, because one tail uh, one t test, which mean based on here, this one is a symmetry, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, we have to represent each, uh, each side. In this case, our value is located on here, not this side. Somehow, depend on the data set, maybe our data would be, could be located on here. In this case, we just uh, use a plus or minus, depend on the, your data set. Then what is a two-tailed D test? Basically, the uh, calculation is the same, but the hypothesis is a bit different. Can you see that what is the difference? Yep, right here. So yeah, does it mean we want to know is it the same or different? But we don't know which one is larger, which one is lesser, right? So for the reason we don't, we don't say this one is a directional because we don't know each direction, which one is bigger, which one is smaller, we don't know that. So that is, uh, for the reason we say that this is a two-tailed t-test, and then uh, if we just adopt the same number from the previous slide, then we can calculate everything is the same here. But the critical value, this is come from the, the g-test distribution table, but the critical value is different. Can you see that? Because our, our data, our g-score still represent minus 1.67, so it is, this is less than this point, right? So this will be located, located around here, which means is this significant or non-significant? Significant? As I mentioned here previously, because the value is a minus 1.67, so the value is located here because this is zero and that is further away and located around here. And because the value located within this area, so we can say that is a significant, right? But here, the G critical value has been changed, right? And then our value is, uh, for the reason our value will not be located within this area. Our value will be around here, right? So is this significant or non-significant? Non-significant, because this value is not located inside here, inside the critical, uh, G critical value, right? Why this happen? because we wanted to keep the significant level at the point 0 0.05, right? But in this case, that is a two-tailed test, and we don't know the each direction, which means if we just take up this one at the 5.05, then because we took uh, both sides at the same time, so that would be Point, point, point one. The significant level will be point one. We don't we don't want to keep uh, that that significant level because we still want to keep uh, this much level to get the significant p value, right? For the reason we just uh, cut off each half. So the left side will have a point zero twenty five, and the right side also have a point zero twenty five. For the reason, the G critical value is uh, much higher. So uh, the key is a uh, one-tailed t-test is statistically a more powerful test than two-tailed test. Does it make sense? Because uh, in this case, we just don't know its direction. For the reason, we just cut off the uh, each uh, significant level in this in this distribution, 
for the reason the critical value was much higher, right? But in the previous one, in this case, our hypothesis is also represent this uh, increase not only uh, it is the same or, or, or different, but also include its direction, which is a much higher, much lesser, right? So in this case, the critical value is much less, and then our value will be located around here. So even though we use the same number, depend on the, its test type, the statistics result is different. Okay, so still we, go, uh, we are talking about what is a parametric test and what is normal distribution. Okay, let's talk about the uh, t-test. Because we already uh, had uh, some sense about what is a uh, one tail or two tail, so maybe you can conject what does it mean. But there is only difference is that previously we talked about the G test, but right now we want to talk about the T test. What is the major difference between the uh, T test and G test? Uh, what was the characteristic of the G test? What was the biggest characteristic of the G test? Do you remember? Because from the G-test, we always know uh, it will follow normal distribution, and then it already has a mean value and the variance, right? But actually, in practical, it is a bit hard to get variance already. So T-test is assuming the population variance is, not, is unknown. And another difference is that t-test is uh, sometimes or although the, it also follow the symmetrical and the bell shape, but t-test do not fit the standard normal distribution. So maybe that is, uh, in my sense, this is a much practical uh, in, in general. So as you mentioned, uh, this is a one tailed t-test, so it could, uh, when you set up the hypothesis testing, it provides us some directional. So as you see here, so it provides the direction. Uh, what is a null hypothesis? That is mu is uh, less than or equal to uh, mu one. And the alternative hypothesis is mu zero is rather than uh, mu one. So let's say, uh, let's see some uh, data set here. We have a, a 10 data sets here, and then there is a, the sample means that is a one, a 10 hundred, uh, 1176.60. then because the t-test is the same as we uh, calculated uh, each uh, standard deviation for the sample data, t-test also wanted to calculate it how much our data set is deviated from the uh, given uh, data set. So we call this denominator as estimated standard error of the mean because we don't know the variance, right? So maybe our data set could have some um, errors in, in our sample data. So we wanted to estimate how much uh, each error uh, our data set included already. So we can uh, calculate it uh, with this equation because uh, this represents this denominator and that is a standard deviation and we wanted to divide with our number, our sample number here. So in this case, this is gonna be uh, roots uh, with 10. And then I'm going to talk about why we are doing the minus one a little bit later. 
But anyway, just, just assuming this, uh, this uh, denominator will change with this, uh, this shape, okay? And then finally, we can get this number here, 131.80. So uh, we can apply this number to the previous formula here. And then finally, the t value, we can get this number, positive 2.06. What does it mean? Uh, using the t, uh, table, t table, you can, you can uh, Googling uh, from the website, what is a t table as well. So uh, it says that the t critical value is 1.833. But our, our data, which is a t uh, obtained value, is 2.06. Because our value is located in this, uh, this area, so what does it mean? Is this significant? So, yeah, I just uh, misses the final representation of this data. So finally, we can say, we can, we can say p value p is uh, less than 0 0.05 with this value, right? And then this is the uh, t distribution table. So in this case, uh, because we, in here, we use the, this number, m minus 1. So what is the m minus number? That is a 9. And then we wanted to see at the 0.05 uh, uh, level. So this is the, the critical value of this data set, right? But I do not talk about then why we subtracted 1 from the m. Let's say uh, we have uh, this type of a data set. The number of data set is uh, just a six, and then the mean is uh, 15, uh, eight. The mean value is eight. So this is uh, just a fixed data set, but let's say actually this is uh, just a sample data, so actually we don't know uh, what numbers we count after we pick up some number of uh, uh, data from the population, right? So maybe this number can be very, and this number also can be very, and then this number, this number, this number, and this number as well, right? But just imagine we wanted to, uh, just we can give us some possibility, we, this number always can vary, but we still want to keep the mean value. So unless we keep the mean value, this number can be very any, to any, any values. So, in this case, maybe after we can uh, change this value some something, maybe three, then because we want to keep this number, so maybe the next value can be four, or this uh, uh, number can be eight, then maybe this ca number can be seven, and this number just for the 11, so whatever. So in this case, every number can have a possibility to change the other data set. That's fine, unless we keep the mean value. But what I wanted to say is, uh, uh, in the, this, uh, we call this is a degree of freedom. What does it mean? Every sample number has a, uh, its degree of freedom, which means it can vary to any numbers unless it keep its characteristic of the sample data set. In this case, the characteristic of the data sample is a mean value, right? So unless we keep this one, every value can be very. But do you, uh, let's say because we, uh, when we're doing the inference statistics, the most important factor is the variation. 
the variance of the data set because we always just compare with based on the uh, vari uh, variance, right? So this number changes makes some uh, variance of the data set, right? Can you understand what I'm saying? Every, every data, each uh, data element can be varied. And then if this number uh, changed to three, and the, maybe if number changed to three as well, then maybe this number should be compensated with uh, uh, 12. There's uh, two threes appeared here, which means the data distribution, the shape of the data, distri data distribution has been changed. So we have to understand this concept of what is a deal or freedom. This is uh, affected to the, uh, the final, final result. In this case, let's see that. Because we already, in the previous data set, we had a 10 data set. So 10 minus one is a nine, right? So the degree of freedom was nine. But let's say, let's see that uh, unless, if we just see the same column at the 0 0.05 level, if we uh, get the nine samples as a degree of freedom, then the number was 1.8, right? And then if we just imagine if we have a 20 data set, actually 21 data set, which is a much larger sample data, then each value is less than here, right? Just imagine if we have an infinite number of sample data, then its value for the uh, distribution is a 1 point, uh, 1.64. Can you remember what was this number? This number was the number for the G distribution. What was the characteristic of the G distribution? We said that G distribution follows the normal distribution, right? So what was the normal distribution? Normal distribution is a theoretical distribution, right? So which means if we takes more samples, then the result will follow the normal distribution. For the reason, many samples will make stronger the static power. That is the reason. Do you understand the, the main idea? Yeah. <coughs> so, And the two t test is the same, the uh, calculation process is the same, except that we can set the hypothesis with this, uh, this scheme. So we don't know the each direction, we just want to know uh, it is same or not, that, that's all. So that is the same. Uh, for the same region, the critical value is uh, different compared to the uh, one tailed t test. And then our value is outside of the uh, critical, t uh, critical value. So for the reason, we could say this is a non-significant. Correct? All right. Then can you, uh, before I talk about more about the two-group design, uh, so what is the big difference between the G-test and the T-test? Okay, so what is the same thing between the G and the T test? The difference is that you've got your uh, mean and your weighted means. Yeah, variance. Yeah, yeah. We don't know the actual variance uh, for the T test. And then does T test follow the normal distribution? No, okay, so what is the important actually to get the Similar level of a G test result. Sorry, could you repeat 
So yeah, to get the similar level of g-test distribution, what would be enough factor? Uh, what would be important factor for t-test? Degree of freedom. And then what does it mean the degree degree of freedom? So actually, the simply, what is what is that? Number of number of samples, right? Degree of, of freedom means number of samples, actually. So if we get much number of samples, then our degree of freedom will be higher, which means we can get more accurate uh, result uh, compared to the G-test, right? And then how many sample types we have compared in T-test and G-test? I don't ask you the number of samples. I ask you how many types of samples. How many, how many type of samples do we compare in G test and T test? I gave you an example that is uh, if we wanted to check it out our intelligence level in the university, right? Before. So in this case, how many type of sample did we compare to the previous data? In this case, we just compared one type of sample that is related to our inter intelligence level, right? So there is only one sample type, which is university student, right? But in practical, depend on your research topic and depend on your research area, but in practical, actually, we will usually have more than two, uh, two comparison, two type of comparison, right? So for example, you can develop some interface A, and then also you can uh, create an interface B, so you may want to compare these two type of uh, items, right? So in this case, we want to uh, compare uh, these two type of, of studies, two type of items. In this case, we don't know what is uh, uh, the population, what is the actual population variance, right? Because we just uh, collected data, this one, and also we just collected data, this one. So we don't, we don't care about what is the space study, what is the method study, don't care about it. So just think about this is just A and B, okay? So what will be the hypothesis? The neural hypothesis could be uh, the A is less than or equal to master study, and then the alternative one is uh, the A is uh, larger than master study. That is the hy our hypothesis, right? And then we wanted to uh, run the statistics. Because uh, as we did before, so to get the T obtained value, so we wanted to follow the same procedure as you did here, right? But what is the only the difference? In the previous one, because there is only one type of samples to be compared, right? For the reason, we only uh, calculated the estimated standard error of the mean for, the, for that sample only, right? But in here, because we have a two sample, right? So we wanted to estimate the standard error of the difference between the means from the, those samples. And you only consider the mean of the sample or the population? In this case, we don't know the population. Okay. Yeah, right? So we can calculate this one as we did in the one tailed t test. That is the same things, but only the difference is because we have a two samples here, so we just calculate for two samples for standard deviation. OK. 
Can you understand? Yep. And then finally, we can get the, this number. We just uh, put this formula to here. This side is only for this one, and this side is only for this one. We get the, the mean value here, and the mean is a 22 here, and the, how can you get the, the standard deviation? This one, what is the minus one? Degree of freedom, right? So just minus one, and this is degree of freedom, and then we get the value here, and then finally we can get the, the final value, just the sum of everything, and put them into the uh, formula, and then finally we can get the t, t values here. Um, mm -hmm. When you calculate the standard deviation, mm -hmm. what, what is x1 minus minus one minus one? What what? Okay, so what does it mean? So that is the mean of right. the sample population. Which is sample? The first sample. This one, yeah. right? And what is this one? Yeah. I'm, I'm asking oh, you. Oh, I don't know because you, it, it's supposed to be the population mean. No. Let's think about it, what does it mean, uh, each, each value. Because uh, actually, basically, we want to have a com when we're doing the inferential statistics, basically we want to have a comparison in the distribution. That is a basic idea. So there is a something uh, variation, and maybe there is something variation we want to compare how much these variations are far from each other. If, uh, if we say this is enough, uh, far enough, then maybe we can say this is less than 5.05, .05, or if some values are too, seems like a almost overlap, then maybe we can say this is a non-significant, right? Then why we calculate the mean value? Because the mean is our basis, right? And then we want to put, uh, let's say this is the mean, and then we want to put Every, com every data, how far from the mean? So this one is uh, every component of the each data. Can you understand? So in this case, uh, the first one is 23, 23 minus 22. So some data is uh, just uh, locate, locate the something, something is here. And then this one is uh, 18 minus 22. So there is a negative four, something like that. So the equation is very simple, but the key is uh, understanding why we do this kind of stuff. Because we want, our interesting part is we want to know the deviation of each data based on something, what is that something? In this case, there is a mean. Understand? So uh, finally, we can represent the result with this way. So what is this one, 18? Can that chart? What is the 18? Because we have a two data sample, right? So this is a degree of freedom, and the one degree of freedom per sample was nine, right? We have a 10 data set here, so the degree of freedom is nine. And this one also, the degree of freedom for this one is nine. So the total will be 18 for this data, for total, right? Does it make sense? And the value is a 4.92 because this value is a pretty far from the mean and even beyond the critical value. So we could say that as a, the p-value is significant. Correct? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this one. So the key formula of this t-test is uh, this part, 
Agree? Right? So how do you think? How do you think about what uh, implications can you uh, get from this formula? Okay, so, uh, the characteristic of the T, uh, this two group design is, this is the T test, okay? Uh, T test. But the characteristic of the, this type of T test is we just compare each independent variable, right? So that is the first uh, characteristic of this uh, formula. For the reason, we have uh, two mean values and the two standard deviations, right? And the key is depend on your, your research topic, but most of the time, maybe we want to get some, we want to see significant difference, right? In this case, what is your expectation after you calculated the T value? Maybe you want to, your T value is large enough to look at at least within this critical value. That will be your goal. That is not always, but depend, most of the time we just want to see some difference. Am I correct? Then how can you uh, enhance, how can you make larger this value with this formula? We want to get large value of this one, right? The one way is if we get large value over here, then maybe the final value of the T will be higher, correct? But it is normally a bit hard to get um, with this one. Then what will be the next step? That is, if we uh, reduce the, this value, then we can get more higher value here. Am I correct? Then what does it mean here? What does it mean if we reduce the this value. What was this S? Standard deviation. Standard deviation. What does it mean? How much the sample deviates from the population. Population what? In the middle, mean value, right? Mean value. Yeah, yeah. So, which means that is actually represent the error, right? So, yes. if the uh, standard deviation is, uh, has a wide value, then it seems like it has a much, uh, it includes much errors inside there. So if we reduce the standard deviation, maybe it, it sometimes come from the confounding or come from the wrong study design, then the standard deviation will be large. But if we have a very solid uh, study experiment, the design, then maybe that is a wonderful way to reduce the standard deviation, right? And the last one is the degree of freedom, which means, as we mentioned before, just before, if we increase the number of samples, then we can get more solid and then we can get more higher value of T value. So from this formula, uh, this kind of insight is very important to understand why we doing the statistic, uh, inference of statistics, and why we doing the G-test, when we doing the G-test, and why we doing the T-test, when we doing the uh, T-test with the two groups. That is uh, very important. Uh, make sense? Okay, uh, let's take a break, maybe just five minutes and then let's keep talking about it. I'm going to give us some example here. So, in the G-test and the T-test, 
whatever it is a one tailed or two tailed, we just uh, having comparison uh, compared to the population. And the population sometimes gives uh, already uh, some data, mean value and the variance. And in t-test, it doesn't provide the variance. But anyway, we just compare with our sample data compared to the population, correct? And in the two group t-test, uh, we just uh, having comparison between the two independent variables, right? So in this case, do we have uh, some population? No, we don't have. We just uh, having some data set from the one data set and from the second data set. We just having comparison. But maybe you may want to develop interface A and the interface B, and then finally you want to also have in comparison with the interface C. So in this case, we have a three uh, independent variables. What would be the best way? How do you think? Just don't think about uh, statistics. Just in your case, I just want to give uh, some three items to him, and he, uh, I just ask him, can you just um, have a comparison each weight? Then how will you do that? Compare two and two. Yeah, two and two and two. Yeah, that is the best way, maybe. A, B, B, C, and A, C. And finally, whatever, and the two more comparison. But in statistics, so maybe we can do a multiple t test because we already run that uh, between, between uh, two group t test. We can having comparison between two items, two data sets. So maybe we can think about it. Okay, then I can run t test several times to make a comparison. But the problem is, it can arouse uh, error for the uh, significant level. Because at the first time, actually, we always wanted to keep with its convention that uh, we want to keep the, this level, 0.0.5 level or 0.0.1 level. But if we doing uh, several times with a t-test, because it's a um, mathematical problem, so maybe you can just uh, look, look around yourself, we can calculate each each error with this one. So finally, if we just do running t-test several times, then the significant level will be uh, goes higher. This is a makes much significant error, right? For the region, uh, we're gonna use uh, ANOVA. That is uh, analysis over variance, which is uh, the basic idea is the same. Because uh, even though we can use a t-test to compare multiple items, but if we're having the comparison this one first, and then this one first, this one next, this one next, then it will accumulate its significant level error. So the ANOVA is we just calculate everything at once, which means we still keep the significant level at the 5 .5, uh, 0 0.5 level or 0 0 0.0.1 level. That is an over. So maybe in your paper last time when you're doing your uh, assignment, maybe you could so you can you could see this type of representation. There was a significant effect of an interface used on test completion time with F something. We don't know what does it mean, but anyway, F something, and there is some value here, and this one is the p value, right? So let's talk about the ANOVA. So one way ANOVA, what does it mean the one way? Does it also mean some direction about the hypothesis? No. In this case, the one way means that it's a factor. That is a number of independent variables. So uh, in the previous data set, we, we says that in the t-test, also we can have uh, some two, uh, two groups, right? Two group tests uh, in the t-test. But in ANOVA, the one way means 
number of independent variables, factor. This means uh, represent the factor. And then within this factor, we can also have a multiple level. Does it make sense? So in his case, uh, if he want to invent interface A and then invent it to interface 2, and then having compared them in terms of its interface, the interface is the factor, right? So this is a one way, and there is only um, and this is the level. So we can say there is a one way with a two level experiment. Understand? So let's talk about a little bit deeper. So uh, we're going to talk about one way and over here. When we calculate the ANOVA, then uh, we're going to use a mean square that is a square value and with a, a mean value with a square. That is just a simple idea. And what was the DF? That is a, a degree of freedom. And what is the total degree of freedom? This is a just a, uh, some data set. So if you, you are not familiar with the number, that's fine. So we run some. Uh, Give me one second, maybe I forgot some slide on here. Give me one second. Yes. Oh yeah, this one. So let's say uh, there is a three comparison, this one and this one and this one, okay? And then to get the uh, ANOVA, we get this value, this is uh, uh, the total standard, oh, I forgot the terminology. Uh, yeah, scaled scale sum, that is a scaled sum, so it is a bit hard to read. This is a scaled sum for total value, so which means we just uh, calculated this scaled sum for per each data set, and then that is the, this number. And then what is that this one? Because uh, think about it, because we want to, to have a competitor between the each group, right? So in this case, in this case, we just calculated this scaled sum per each data set. This one in this way. And this one is a scaled sum for within data set, which means we want to calculate it each column per each data set. Which means we calculate everything. We already got the total, total value, and also we already get the between, between value per each data. Uh, each, uh, each factor, which is a one way, and then also we calculate every this directional, this vertical way, which is within. What does it mean? We calculate every data inside each level. And here, and here, and here. So for example, uh, let's see, this is uh, just mean values, and then what does it mean, the grand mean, which is uh, just the mean of all of them, right? So that is a grand value. And let's see, the, this is the x represent each data set. And the, what does it x hat with z? That is a, this mean. So this is makes sense. We already having the mean value. And then this is a calculate every devi uh, the, the deviation per each, each values compared to the, this total mean value. So we calculate everything here. Does this make sense? And then we doing the sum here. And this data set also doing the same way. And then what is this one?
what is this one? What is uh, xg and then x small g and then x large g? x large g represent the grand mean here and the small g represent What does it what does it represent? Each of yeah, each of mean values per uh, each data set. So the grand mean is a default compared to each mean value per each data set, right? So it seems like a little bit complicated, but basic idea is we just wanted to calculate the every deviation, every possible deviation with vertical way and the horizontal way compared to the total value. Because we don't want to have in comparison one by one. If we compare the each uh, three of them, uh, to, uh, if we have this compare with these two first and this one and this one, then it will allow some more error in terms of uh, the significant level. So we just wanted to calculate everything at once. Any question? Can I go next? Okay. <laughs> so that is the, how can you calculate it the numbers, this is the uh, degree of freedom per uh, each, each calculation, degree of freedom for this one, there is a total within and between. And then I calculated this one here, and then what is the mean square, the between and within, that means we just uh, divide with the degree of freedom per, uh, with the squared sum. We already calculated of the the each squared sum already, right? And then uh, we have to think about it, then what does it mean? We always know what is the degree of freedom, that's fine. Then what is the, why we have to uh, divide it with this number? What does it mean? And then what is the final F? So F represents MS within, uh, MS uh, between divided by MS within. So what does it mean? The basic idea is already the same. In the previously, we, uh, can you remember when we doing t-test, we subtracted uh, every x component minus uh, with uh, the, the mean value. And we divide the, the sum of that value with the standard deviation because we want to get the, the level of deviation for the sample data, right? So the idea is also the same. But the problem is, in this case, we just, uh, we want to uh, calculate the deviation uh, at once for the three of them, right? So for the reason, we calculate everything for the horizontal, horizontal way, which is a between, and then vertical way, which is within, right? That is just to still represent each deviation. But deviation from the, uh, just think about that as a two dimensional things. So we just want to know that each deviation for the, the x axis and the y axis. And then finally, we just uh, divide the, each deviation with this number, the between and the within, and the final we get this number. That is a F. I'm not sure why we use this term. Maybe that follows with the researcher's name, I guess. Anyway, what does it mean, this one? Then, which mean, because we already have a, uh, more than two groups, and that is a three groups, in this case, we want to know the relationship, correlate the relationship is each data set. 
and we just distributed each data set, how much each data set are uh, differently distributed or not. So we wanted to know how much, so is there any, uh, is there anything else, at least one data was distributed far from the other two, two of them? That is the question. So F uh, represents the distribution of the data set of the all of the data set. So normally we text the, if the F value is uh, larger than one, then that is a, a significantly we can approve it. But let's see it more. So finally, we can uh, summarize the data with this table like that. So that is a, a degree of freedom. That is a two, makes sense, right? And then 21, makes sense, right? And then 23, it makes sense. And then the total always, uh, the sum of these two have to be always the same with the total. So if you find your degree of freedom has a different value when you sum of this one compared to the, your total, then maybe you did something wrong, okay? So you have to check it out. And then the standard, uh, standard sum should also, this one should have the same value with this one. So if you have a wrong value, then you, you made a something, something error in your data set when you're doing your calculation. Okay, so this is a really good tool to check it out yourself. So in this case, let's see that. Uh, this is a degree of freedom representation, and it is also a representation for the degree of freedom, but this is a within, and this is a between. That is a very um, intuitive way. So we have a, the, what is the between groups uh, degree of freedom was two here, and then what was the within groups degree of freedom was 21. So our value is uh, here, 5.78. Because our value is uh, rather than this value, so then we can say, okay, our F distribution has significant value. So we can say the P value, this P value is related to this one, okay? Not general P value. So this F distribution has significantly uh, distri uh, differently distributed, right? So usually we can uh, represent the F value result with this, uh, this, uh, this way. What is two? What is a 21? Degree of freedom, yeah. And the degree of freedom for between and the for within, right? Understand? And that is the, the value from the calculation from the data set. And then this one uh, has to be decided based on this table, just having comparison. Does it make sense? But as we mentioned, uh, even though we learn uh, ANOVA test, one way ANOVA test. Actually, we don't know. We only know if we have a something a significant p value, then maybe we, we can conjecture that, okay, there is something different, but we don't know which one is larger than something, which one is less than something. For the reason, we have to compare each other. This is a different one compared to the t test. This is a different technique. So we call that as a postdoc test. So I don't, uh, talk about much more about this one, but uh, after you doing an over test, you should running this post hoc test as well, okay? So because all of this tool actually already implemented in the software package or uh, the APIs, so actually uh, in practical, you don't have to calculate by your hand. That's not a good idea, but understanding what uh, the inside of the each statistics is really important to enhance your ability, which statistic tool you can apply on your data set. So that is a postdoc test. Then 
maybe we can also think about it. Okay, so in G test and the T test, we having only one sample data set, right? And in the two group T test, we can have a two groups, right? And in ANOVA test, we can have a more than two groups, three or four, but each attribu attribution is the same, right? Each, each general factor is the same. So for the reason, we could, we could say that it's a one-way ANOVA test, right? But how do you think if we have another factor as well? For example, when she develops some interface A and B and C, she focused on each shape could be affected on the performance. And then the other one is uh, uh, maybe each side. Each side, okay, let's say color and the side. Color and side is, has a different value, right? That is a totally independent factors each other. So in this case, maybe we want to have a competitor in terms of performance. That is a color, and then maybe she want to use a red and green. And this is a size. Maybe uh, just a five centimeter. I'm not sure whatever, and then ten centimeter. So in this case, we say that this is a factorial design because there is a much uh, combination we can conjecture from this one. Basically, this is also ANOVA, but when you do actual your test, maybe this is um, most frequently you can consider for your study, my guess. So color and the size is a pretty different factor, correct? Color and the, and the size is a very independent of each other. And each color has a two variable uh, condition, which is uh, when participants have a red and a green, and the side when participants have a five centimeter size or 10 centimeter size. That is a, a factorial design. When we're doing such a thing, uh, we should consider about the interaction impact and the main impact. What is the interaction impact? How do you think? What is that? Yeah, maybe. Actually, we don't know. Actually, we are, even though we, we think, we could think about ourselves, okay, my study design is very perfect. I controlled everything. I controlled perfectly. So there's a non-confounding. No, it always happened. And the other factor is, even though I thought that the size and the color is an independent relationship, so it doesn't have to affect each, uh, uh, it doesn't affect anything on the other condition. That is my, uh, my goal, that was my goal. But in an impractical way, somehow the side could affect on the color. Vice versa, the color also could affect something on the size, right? So that is an interaction impact. So when you're doing the two by two or three by two, whatever uh, fact, uh, factorial design, you have to check it out, the main effect and then the in interaction impact in your, and you have to report it in the paper, right? So this, is, this could be the, the example. So in this case, how many factors do we have? How many factors do we have in this graph? Why? Okay, uh, so two or three? It's okay, so two or three, how do you think? Two or three? Five, Five okay. 
three, two, two, okay, four, three, two, three, okay. That is a, the correct answer is a two. Okay, so why two? Gender and interface, right. So gender, so it represents with the color and the interface. And then what is this one? This is a dependent variable. So what we want to measure, right? Good. So uh, the two-way ANOVA, the relationship between the interaction impact and the main impact could be represented with these eight cases. So it is a bit hard to get it. So let me quickly check it out. Uh, give me one second. Okay. Okay, so let's say uh, this diamond uh, uh, indicates the R, and this rectangle uh, indicates the I. And then maybe we don't, we don't care about this number, so if we see the number, then maybe you can get some more idea, but actually you can get, if this graph has a main impact or interesting impact, we can decide it only with this graph. So in this case, how do you think? Is there any main impact or interaction impact? Okay, it doesn't have anything. Because uh, if we see the main impact, but there's a you see that this graph and this graph is overlapped perfectly, so which means its performance is the uh, same. So there is a no, we don't see any distinguished uh, main effect between the, uh, the type, right? And then when we see the, the word type, also when we have an abstract one, the performance was same, and the concrete one, the performance also was the same. So there is no main impact, right? And then is there any interaction impact? The key for, to check out the interaction impact is that when they have intersect each other, then we could say that there is an interaction impact. But there is no intersection, right? That just aligned with a parallelly. So no interaction and then no main impact. What about this one? Does this have an interaction impact? Yes. yes, because there is a one intersection here, so we can say, okay, there is an interaction effect. What about the main effect? Does this help? The main effect, uh, so how many main effects we can expect in this situation? Because we have uh, two factors, right? Uh, in this case, maybe word type and, and then, okay, let's say type A and type B. So maybe, possibly, there could be two uh, main impacts, or just one or nothing. So let's think about it. So in this case, because you see that this diamond and then this rectangle has a different performance, so it could have this one has a more uh, main impact rather than this one, correct? Okay. And then also, when you see the word type, the word type, in this case, the performance was the same, but in this case, the performance was pretty different, right? So word type also has a main impact. Am I correct? So let's say word type is A and then the real set type is B. So A and B both has a main impact on this graph. Understand? What about this one? Yeah. 
does this have an interaction impact? Is there any intersection? No, so no interaction effect, right? What about the main effect? Does A has a main effect? The word type, does this one has a main effect? Abstract has a this value and concrete has a this much value, so it has a main effect. But when you see the B, the type of uh, this one, it always goes with in the same way, right? So there is a no main effect. Am I correct? What about this one? Is there an interaction effect in here? Yeah. Yes, because there is a one intersection. And what about the main effect of the A, the word type? Does it help? Yes, it is. You see that here, right? Even though in this case, we don't see, right? But in this case, the abstract and the concrete has a different performance, right? Okay. But the, the type for the, these guys, we don't see any interesting effect in here, right? Okay. There is another four type. So what about this one? Interaction effect, do we have? No, there is easy. And the, what about the main effect for the word type? No, the performance is already the same. Then what about the, this type of things? Does it have interaction effect? No? No? It has. Because its performance is different. This one is a diamond, this is a rectangle. And the, do not uh, confuse with this line. Just think about the dot. So when you see here, when we have a root, our performance was two, around two. When we have an imagery, then the performance was eight. So it has a main effect. Correct? Yep. What about that one? Interaction effect? Yes. And then what about the main effect for the word type? This is a little bit hard to say yes it is or not because it's somehow maybe we can say yes it has or somehow I'm not sure that the difference is only about 1.5 so we're not sure. So this is a bit ambiguous one. What about the main effect of B? This one, the type. I would say yes. Right? Okay, almost there. No interaction effect. And then it has a main effect uh, of the word type, right? Yes. And then also it has a, a, some difference between the, the type. So type B also has an interaction effect. Lastly, it has an interaction effect here, right? And then what about the, the main effect, the word? No. And then about the, the type? No. no. And then that, when you see your data set actually, then it is a more uh, explicitly you can make a decision. Does it have an interaction effect? Does it have a uh, main effect? So this is uh, really important when you run your statistics. Okay, so uh, so far we have talked about the parametric test, and then let me question again. So what was that characteristic of the parametric test? When we when we can run the parametric test? Yes, and. Normal distribution, which means it has a symmetrical uh, shape, and then it also follow the, the central theorem. Central limit theorem. 
yeah, a central limited theorem. And the data set seems like a interval or ratio, right? So in this case, we, the other one is we know that which one? The variance, right? I mean. I mean, yeah. So the variance, if we know, actually the mean is uh, not the requirement because we already, if you know the, the variance, then we already just make a comparison between the variance. So the parametric uh, test means if we have uh, this uh, requirements, we always go with the parametric test. Otherwise, if our data set doesn't show up with this requirement, we should go with a non-parametric test. So the basic idea for the non-parametric test is that that is not an interval ratio data. And then uh, when we have ordinary data or nominal data, then we go with a non-parametric test. OK, uh, this is a different one. So I'm go I will not go with uh, the, the details with these test uh, skills, but uh, we, you just uh, check it out. Depend on your study design, your uh, statistical tool will be different. So I've just uh, quickly read these guys. So when you have uh, just one condition against the expected value, then one sample Wilcox signed length test will be uh, run for you. And when you have uh, two conditions, then uh, if you run with a between subject test, then man winning you test will be required. And then if you go with a within subject test, Wilcox signed uh, length test will be required for your uh, statistics analysis. And the three or more condition, what does it mean? That is uh, ANOVA, something like ANOVA, right? But we don't use uh, ANOVA in this case because ANOVA we work with a parametric study, parametric test, because this is a non parametric. So the mapping, the matched uh, analyzed uh, statistics are uh, when you have a between subject test, then Kuroska Wallis test will be required. And then if you go with a within subject test with uh, more than three uh, data set, then through condition, then Friedman test will be required. After once you've done Kruska Wallis and the Friedman test, as we did in ANOVA, what will be required after you've done this kind of a study? What I'm saying is that after we conducted ANOVA, then we have to conduct some study, some uh, statistics. What was that? Because after the ANOVA, maybe we can get some answer. Okay, this data set has uh, some difference or not. Yeah. But post hoc, right. So uh, in the non-parametric test, it also requires post hoc. All right, uh, if you can, please read this paper. That is really interesting. And the Sigkai test. So let's talk about this one. So Sigkai test is uh, uh, almost the same with the uh, G test, okay? But this is uh, just a non-parametric version. So let's uh, see inside the, uh, the statistics. So let's say uh, there is a the rate, uh, rate ratio is, is a 17% and the number of samples are 80. And uh, we have a, let us assume that 17% female to be pregnant uh, in some hospital. Which means uh, we, can, we can get the number, number is a 14, right? Here. And then vice versa, 83% female to be not pregnant, pregnant in, in that hospital, in the same hospital, right? So the number will be 66. Does it make sense? Okay, so we can summarize the, the result here like that. Uh, here is the, our observed data, seven and then 73, and then this is our expected data w from this calculation, right? And the 14, 16, six. So the chi-square is the same actually. The only the difference is uh, each attribution for for the data, 
because in the g-test, we assume that that is normally distributed, and then normally distributed means that it is theoretically distributed well. But in this case, we just collect the data, which is uh, uh, not a inter interval data, not a ratio data, that is just nominal or ordinary data. So we don't say that, that we follow the normal distribution. For the reason, we just calculate with the same way compared to the G test, but only the data, the, the characteristic of the data is different. So here, we just do it this way, and then that is the, the procedure of the mass. And then this is the chi-square, so we just represent the chi-square with this one, this way, and the number of the participant, the value, it also has a, uh, the, the table, so compared to the table, this value located within the, the critical value, so we could say the p-value is less than 0 .0 0 0 0.05, which is a significant, right? So uh, usually we can represent the data with this way, so maybe in the report, you can, you can talk about this one. So finally, the chi-square, the 2 was point, uh, 7.4, p-value was uh, less than point, point 0.0247. Normally, we just rounded from the, the, the two digits around here. But uh, still, uh, there is a limitation in terms of inference of statistics, actually. Uh, for example, this is a really good example. If we get this number, then actually does it really, does it have a really some meaning in the data set? That is uh, depend on the situation actually, which means even though we run the statistics, inference of statistics with a, a solid way, that is not always a guaranteed your analysis is correct. So inference of statistics is not guaranteed anything actually. Somehow it gives a really good uh, insight regarding your data set. But even though, okay, I found a p-value here, but actually it is a bit uh, tricky. Our data set has a really good meaning, so that is a uh, truth, we can, we can say something like that. And then uh, this is uh, some different topic. In HCI and still in VR, we are, uh, when we analyze the data, we usually use this kind of a parametric or non-parametric uh, data analyzation, analyzed. We're doing the analyze with these statistic tools. But somehow there is a, some skeptical uh, perspective if we just use uh, ANOVA or we just use uh, multiple ANOVA, which is a um, MANOVA, uh, then uh, some researchers uh, begin to think about it. Does this really work for uh, this kind of data set? Because as you see that, there is uh, some um, weak point in terms of uh, the error uh, standard, uh, standard deviation error, and then there is uh, some weak point for the number of population, number of samples, S and then confoundings always existed around the, the, your study design. So that is a bit tricky, even though we use uh, ANOVA, even though we use a t-test, there is not always a guarantee your test is uh, good. So I'm not sure, maybe have you heard about the Bayesian analysis, right? The Bayesian probability, no? Okay, so that is a kind of a conditional probability, which is based on some condition, we can conjecture the how, uh, how many times the next event will happen based on the certain condition. And the extended idea of this one is a Bayesian probability. So some researchers using that uh, theory, the Bayesian 
analyze, analyzation when they analyze their, their, their data. So just, uh, I just wanted to um, talk about a little bit more about the current stage of the statistics. Even though this is our really basic tool and it's still valid, but this is not the, all the things to analyze the, our data. So if you have uh, some interest in a more strong, uh, strong analysis method, analyzation, then maybe you can uh, spend your, your eyes to other, to other uh, structure and the other methods as well. Okay, uh, finally, this is the typical way when we represent the result in the paper. We call this is the APA style, uh, Association of Psychologists in America or America Psychologist, Psychologist Association, whatever. So this is the a typical way to represent our data. So usually we want to follow that uh, when we're reporting our data. Actually, that is really important. So uh, I strongly recommend you to use this style. So sometimes you see that uh, when we represent this one, that is uh, um, the capital, and this is a raw case with an italic, and then we use uh, the M, S, D, and then the order, that is uh, important. So just getting familiar with that APA, APA style when you report to your data, okay? Assignment. Yeah. So the due date is uh, uh, two weeks later. So I think that, that will be enough time, right? Yeah, <laughs> enough time. Uh, so the basic idea is the same. So there is a two data set. This, this one and this one is a different question. So you have to analyze and then report the result with the APA style, okay? And then, are you okay with the reporting the calculation? It is a bit tedious work, but uh, because I know, I, I would recommend you to use the SPSS or M uh, R or MATLAB or whatever you want to use, whatever you uh, are familiar with, then you can use a certain tool when you analyze the, uh, the data, that's fine. But I just want to make sure you guys uh, understand the procedure well. So please provide the, the calculations as well. And then maybe you can uh, use uh, up to two pages, so please do not overuse uh, three or four pages. And then when you submit the assignment, and then with uh, assignment four with your name. That's right. Yeah. Don't stare me like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then this is uh, our schedule. Just wanted to make sure. So today, this is today we did. And the, uh, the next week, we will have an Easter holiday, right? So we don't have a lecture. And then week 11, we will have a project week, so Rob will drive this session, I guess, okay? And then week 12, I'm gonna go with a statistic three, about one hour regarding the power analysis, which will be a very useful tool for you guys, I guess. That is then deciding how many participants do we have to have, or how many data do we have to have. So, I'm going to talk about the, the power analysis and then we take us some quiz about an hour. So just to prepare the quiz. Uh, the coverage will be uh, from the first lecture to here. But when you, when you look around the, the just the general stuff about the uh, VR stuff, then do not worry about that. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the statistics and then study design part and the evaluation part, okay? So when you see the, for example, you don't need to take a, care about the, the human perception or human factor things, it doesn't matter, okay? Is that like a redemption? Yeah, actually, 
I think the level will be much uh, easier rather than exam. So, but I try to do my best. So, <laughs> just prepare it. Okay. And if you have any question, just send me an email. Then I will try to give my best answer to you. And then, yeah, around uh, five to ten questions. Mm -hmm. And then week three, 13, 14, 15, we're gonna have a paper presentation. So during the Easter week or week 11, I will post some uh, papers. So as far as I know, me, uh, you guys already had a, will have a presentation in the design class, right? So that is the same things actually. So you will have a presentation and they give a report, okay? And the rest of the weeks, you will have a project. Is there any question? Yeah, right. So uh, I will I will post a list of the paper during the Easter. Okay. Then I will send an email to you guys to check it out your your paper whatever you want. Then. Uh, I will just make some order during this time. So maybe three person will have a paper presentation per one day. So for example, three of them and three of them and the two of you. Individual presentation? Individual. This one? This one is a bit different one. This is a, this is a, uh, just a, give us some explanation and then provide some time to prepare how you guys will prepare the project. So this is not the, not this one. This is a, just a paper reading and the presentation about the paper. Okay. Any question? Okay, thank you.